From Microbe TV, this is Twevo. This week in Evolution, episode number 85, recorded on December 20th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Nels LD. Hey, Vincent. Good to be with you from LD Lab Studios. Happy holidays. We're coming up on the season here. Yeah. yeah. Now, I have to get the chat up here. For some reason, again, it's not showing up. It, it, uh, yeah, we're live. We're running live. Thanks, everyone. Uh, where, where, is, uh, where is the chat thingy, Bobby? <laughs> Ooh, Comments and reactions. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Happy holidays to our crew from around the U.S., from around the world. Good to have you all with us this this, uh, morning, afternoon, and evening, depending on where you're joining us from. we got 15 people here today. So let's see where uh, people are from. We have uh, Mr. Kaidman from Sweden. I'd love to hear where you're from, folks. So just put it up, and we'll spend a few minutes doing this, because I and Nels, I'm sure, appreciate you're being here, and uh, we'd Indeed. like to know uh, where you're coming from. Connecticut, it's Hi. good. Hi, Doreen. Welcome. Lost Lab is in Seattle. As always, good to see you, Lost Laboratory. Have I saw Lost Laboratory. Uh, well, this is a good story. You'll like Nels. So Lost Lab took me to dinner in Seattle. I was there for ASTMH. Fantastic. And she, she brought me to some cool restaurant in a neighborhood, a residential neighborhood, and we stopped and took a picture of me in front of Matt Doherty's old place. Yep. Remember him? Of course. Um, I, think, I think I told you this story last you time. You did. We might have covered it. But I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. No, no. Sorry. We're, we're, we're warming, up, warming up the engines here. Um, yeah, I remember when Matt was living in that neighborhood. and Or actually, he might have moved actually one time after I left. But And now, of course, he's running his lab highly successfully at UC San Diego. Okay, Les, thank you for moderating tonight, Les, or this afternoon. Appreciate yeah. that. Um, <laughs> let's see. Oh, I, my computer monitor is too far away. I have to bring it closer. Tom is also moderating. Thank you very much over in uh, Eugene, Oregon. Good to, you, good to see you, Tom. Happy holidays to you as well. Uh, I'll have to next time bring that monitor a little bit closer. We have Barb Mack from the U.K., Wonderful. We've got her Twiv t-shirt. I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, we have, look at this, two people uh, from Scandinavia. All right. Emmy Wheeler from Helsinki. Finland. I've been to Helsinki a couple of times. It's a, it's a fun city. Hoping somehow you're um, consuming this live streaming podcast in a sauna. That would be the <laughs> really next level Jer- scenario. Jeremy's also from Seattle. <laughs> hey, Jeremy, welcome. Now, Jan is here. I know Jan is in Rome, Italy, visiting. Gary's in Colorado. Colorado. Uh, From Milano, sorry. Jan is from Milano. I forgot that you moved from Rome to Milano. Thank you. Uh, Kammer Literature from Germany. Excellent. Welcome. We were just talking about the giant virus meeting coming up next year. Yeah. Back in Bavaria. The uh, Mox Plocked Science Castle. All right, my, my I can turn my volume down a bit. It's fine. Uh, let's see who else. I'm I'm close to the mic here. That's why. Yeah, <laughs> coming in hot. <laughs> coming in hot. Yes. Is my, uh, actually, is my am I still getting a reflection on my face here, or did we work that out in pre-show? Well, uh, folks, uh, tell me if Nels has a little light on his face. I see a light, and he says he doesn't. Uh, okay, <laughs> oh. Kitty's in California. John is in Edinburgh. Well, Wow, Welcome. John, good to have you with us again. Uh, Jail is from PQ, Paris. Yeah. Very good. Welcome. Barbara is from Colorado, cold Colorado. Ooh, yeah, we got that polar vortex coming down in the next couple of days. John here. is from the UK. Welcome, John. Uh, Noir LeBlanc. Hello, Noir. I just saw your uh, Instagram uh, what do you call the damn thing where you have your picture and all the links? Not the uh, feed, but the uh, the page where all your info. Anyway, I saw your page on Instagram, Noir, and I always like to see what people look like. So, oh, Santa Fe, terrific. You know, we have two people there who are fans who um, 
they work at the opera house, right? Oh, very cool. The the couple wow. there, and they made a couple of songs for us during the pandemic. In case oh, very you're, cool. Uh, uh, yeah. Wow. Opera fan. Okay, Laura is in uh, Wisconsin. Very cool. Elizabeth is in West Virginia. Welcome, Elizabeth. Uh, we have New York City Bliss is in the Bay Area. So how can you be New York City Bliss in the Bay Area? <laughs> <laughs> you can bring that East Coast Bliss to the Bay. <laughs> Michael is in... Uh, Nels looks fine to me. Okay, there's no light yeah. on you. Very good. Michael is in uh, South Carolina. Very cool. Welcome. Uh, Chris, Christer is from Sweden. And Emmy hey. says, uh, sauna would be good, but tonight you're going to be in Tuivo. So I guess no, you can't right. do both. Oh, yeah, you don't want to short circuit your... Um, recording or listening device. That's tr that's a good point. Anne is from T Tbilisi, Georgia. Wow. Oh, welcome. Do you know how to say that? Do you say Tbilisi? Is that how it goes? Or I'm, As you know, my uh, pronunciation of names and places is pretty mediocre to be generous. So I'm going to not attempt that. But um, And Milos is in Serbia. Wonderful. Oh, live is cool. Welcome, oh, Milos. boy. All right, we've got, Vincent. We've got a great crew that have shown up. Um, it's really remarkable. Yeah, um, I, I'm always blown away that people show up for you and me now. <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> I know they show up for Amy on Wednesday nights in droves, oh, but of course. <clears throat> we get four to five hundred people. But you and me, oh, you know, two yeah, guys with beards. Okay. Well, they come for you on this show because you're the smart guy. <laughs> well, we'll see. we'll so, put that to rest in a few minutes here. As well, well, Les. Uh, well, not less. Tom said earlier, I really enjoy Nels. Hmm. And uh, I said, yeah, I, I got him. I made him famous. So. <laughs> it's a great team. We're having fun and looking forward to some winter science podcasting for today. So we have speaking, Vincent, of our, um, you know, the community around us that comes in with ideas, interesting questions points us in the right direction. We're doing, we're taking that to heart today and we're doing a listener pick for a paper today. The, the topic that we're going to cover the research that we're going to cover. This is a listener pick from cliff Christian. I don't know if you're on the, the live stream and that's okay. I hope, hopefully you'll catch the recording if not. Um, but this is a really cool paper that just dropped uh, a couple weeks ago mm. It's from Elaine Ostrander's lab at the NIH. And the title here is D Domestic Dog Lineages Reveal Genetic Drivers of Behavioral Diversification. And so, um, Cliff, thanks for the heads up on this one. This is a topic that we've, um, on Twivo, thinking about the evolution of behaviors that we've been very interested in. There's all kinds of interest. Um, in this topic, where do you know what's the genetic basis of <laughs> genetic <laughs> basis of behaviors? Where do these things come from, and how can we you know start to get at sort of the genetics behind these really complex things? And maybe just to stipulate at the front, this is tough. Like this is sort of one of the frontiers, mm. biology, one of the frontiers of evolution. And so, um, you know, don't want to give away the punchline, but I don't think we're going to um, sort of completely blow the conversation out of the water here or change the, there's a, I mean, one take home is there's, there is a lot of complexity the deeper we look. Um, but before we dive in and get into the details, um, let's just lift up the authors here. So this is Emily Dutro, James Serple, and Elaine Ostrander. And um, uh, both Emily Dutro and Elaine Ostrander are at the Cancer Genetics and Comparative Genomics Branch of the National Human Genome Research Institute, part of the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, the intramural research program there. Um, and, you know, the genetics of dog breeds and related <laughs> features, related traits, including today of behavior, has been on the menu for a long time in the Ostrander lab. This is not a new topic. Um, but using some new approaches, some new technology to see if they can raise the bar or advance the bar here. Um, and then James Serple is from the Department of Clinical Sciences and Advanced Medicine at the Penn School of Veterinary Medicine, Philly, uh, Pennsylvania. And um, a really impressive, I was just out at in, in Philadelphia uh, maybe a month or two ago giving a seminar um, as we slowly emerge from pandemic hibernation. And was again reminded what an impressive, interesting place Penn is really a high concentration of academics from the medical school to the arts and sciences to the veterinary school, all sort of uh, mixing together in interesting scientific ways. And so here, collaboration of, as well. 
And everybody loves dogs, right, Nels? And everyone loves dogs. Let's be. And yes, these are these creatures um, <laughs> have sort of woven their ways into our hearts, into our homes through a really fascinating process of, of animal domestication over, you know, fifty thousand years. Um, that maybe really picked up steam 10,000, 15,000 years ago in the history of our species. Um, cats and dogs are, you know, sort of uni unique in some sense in how we've really embraced them or they've embraced us or almost, you know, some people have framed it that we've almost become addicted to these critters. And so this has really been kind of an evolutionary journey together with our species. What's cool um, is that we have, like many other animals, we have bred them to do specific things, right? Yeah, exactly. And so we've talked about this a little bit, you know, on Tweevo Past. Um, I'm thinking of episode seven of Tweevo, one of our first ones. We had a fun interview with Mike Shapiro, who's a colleague of mine here in yeah. biology at Utah. The title is um, Pigeon Fashion Week, Feathery Boots Edition. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and here, so Mike was sharing with us all these really cool, you know, so again, uh, maybe not as, um, you know, pervasive as, is the domestication of dogs and cats are even close, but there are a number of pigeon fanciers mm. that have done a lot of artificial selection, a lot of artificial breeding or breeding for traits that the collectors find to be beneficial or find to be favorable. And so in the case of the Shapiro lab, thinking about pigeons, they've now been using sort of the morphological traits. So this feathery boots, how does, what, what's the genetic basis of that? Um, different sort of crazy things happening with the feather patterns and the colors and, and so forth of the, of the breeds that then they, you know, collectors actually compete and, and score. They have like quantitative scores for the kinds of traits that they're looking for. And so, yeah, and, and that's been super successful. Also some real success cases in dogs as well. Um, a few in cats, um, maybe less so somehow dogs and pigeons have sort of come to the fore, um, to get at, you know, like, how is it that the, you know, the size of the dog or the shape of the dog here, this is sort of a next level, um, um, attempt at getting into, um, behavioral traits, which are a little harder to get your hands on, mm. um, right. Scientifically or biologically than it is like a, a, a black coat color is a very clear, easily yeah. scorable trait. Whereas, you know, if you are good at um, herding sheep, that's a much more <laughs> complicated scenario. And actually, we'll be talking a little bit about that as we dive into the paper here. So the big question, what are the genetic origins of behavioral diversity? And can the dogs sort of lead the way, given that there's been, you know, not just the breeding for the size of the dogs, the sort of, you know, style or whatever, but also the behaviors. So, so, you know, we'll go a little bit more into the weeds here in a minute, but um, some of this tied to like sort of taking what are already probably, you know, existing behaviors. So the types of dogs that go out independently and hunt rats and other critters, um, uh, along with the ones that are, uh, have been developed for herding the border collies, um, you know, you can actually go Vincent, a, a few miles from where LD Lab Studios is located out to Soldier Hollow, which is part of the Winter Olympics. The cross-country skiing is there. But in the summer now, you can see the Border, border Collie Championships, the Herd Dog Championships, where these dogs, there's massively complicated obstacle courses that also involve herding sheep in real time. And it's, I mean, it's wild. And the, it's crazy what we do to dogs, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Well, and not just are, dogs, yeah. but all <laughs> kinds of animals. So what they say here, humans have employed dogs for thousands of years to perform tasks such as herding livestock, killing vermin, hunting, yep. pulling loads, guarding, and companionship. So it's very interesting. And that's the idea here is that maybe we could start to look at the genetic basis for this, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and so the author is, you know, uh, along those lines, even in the first sentence, kind of open up strongly here. So selective breeding of domestic dogs to perform these specialized tax tasks may constitute humankind's most consequential behavioral genetics experiment. And <laughs> I so, never thought of that. Have you? That's really good. <laughs> yeah, I think I like that framing. So, you yeah. know, whether, so I agree, and, but like with all things with an experiment, the question, you know, you don't know what the sort of results are going to be or how incisive that experiment will be. Um, and so we'll, that's what we'll pick up here. And, you know, I think the authors are actually really nicely frame sort of like why, why tackle this really high degree of difficulty question now? Mm. And they, they propose three sort of, um, you know, sort of recent advances that provide new opportunities to try to get at 
the genetic basis of behavior in dogs. And so the first one they lift up and, um, you know, uh, echo to our community here on the This Week podcasts is citizen science. So, hmm. you know, as, as scientists included as citizens here, right? A lot of people who really care a lot about their dogs and um, and want to kind of contribute to that conversation about so, so what is the biology here or what is the genetics? And so um, there's behavioral data sets now for thousands of breeds. Um, and we'll talk about a questionnaire that turned out to be very useful in the analysis that they're doing here. And now that it's being sort of, um, you know, considered at scale, how that gives you enough mm -hmm. data, sort of big data, to, excuse me, to really think about um, how there might be some hidden patterns or some complex patterns related in particular, specifically to behaviors that they want to try to tease apart here a little bit. Um, the second recent advance is in, you know, a topic that we talk about constantly on Tuivo, which is whole genome sequences. Um, not just in humans, um, but sort of um, across the tree of life, but in particular dogs. So, you know, maybe an overlap with the citizen science approaches is that there's a lot of genomes out there, again, for thousands of breeds. And so now you've got sort of on the one hand, these behavioral data sets. On the other hand, you have all of the genetic data sets. They'll spend some time kind of trying to catalog that in a new way um, and then bring it together to see if they can sort of draw some associations or links between the behavior and the genetics here of these dog breeds. Um, and that brings us to the third sort of recent advance that they hold up, which is the tools for analysis of big data sets. And so, I don't know, I want to get out in front of this a little bit, Vincent, and sort of confess my um, sort of um, lack of expertise on doing hmm. things on these sort of <laughs> high dimensional <laughs> yeah. data set analysis. So these are the UMAPs. Um, these are the, um, you know, related uh, they're going to use a tool called um, FATE here, um, but in, uh, all of these are sort of an offshoot of, or uh, in the same category as principal components analysis or PCA mm -hmm. analysis. Mm -hmm. We use a little bit of this in our research, but um, as we're starting to delve into a little bit of single cell um, RNA sequence analysis um, in some zebrafish projects that we're running, um, but mostly I'm kind of leaning on our collaborators. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll obviously this is a sort of central to the analysis of this paper, um, but I don't think, at least on my end, I'm not going to be able to sort of do a deep dive into the exact mm. way that these methods work. Uh, I thought you would be able to, Nels, because I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I can't it's either. okay. I can, <laughs> it's I can okay point. because we can, we can get to, to the conclusions, which I think are really what we want to talk yes. about. That's exactly right. And but if this is a topic where we have some expertise in the audience and or there's interest, I can point to um, uh, some resources here. If you want a pretty skeptical view of the value of principal components of UMAPs of um, I'm sure fate, the tool that we'll talk about falls into this category, too. There's a um, fellow on faculty. Uh, I think he's not Caltech. This is Lior Pachter. Um, P-A-C-H-T-E-R. You can find him on Twitter where he's been sort of launching scalding um, critiques of um, UMAPs and how they, um, mm -hmm. and PCA, and how sometimes these patterns as we're trying to sort of intuitively walk through um, relationships or patterns in high density or big data sets um, can kind of maybe fool fool you into thinking there's more um, beneath the surface here. So I think worth taking with a grain of salt, but obviously um, as we're um, as a lot of groups are increasingly, uh, scientists are increasingly, including evolutionary biologists, are increasingly yeah. interested in analyzing big data sets. You know, this is sort of the state of the art of um, how to do this and to try to kind of squeeze some patterns or understanding out of what is like, you know, just a, a overwhelming sea of data. Okay, so I think that sets the table here. So what is the data? And this turns out to be um, about 4,200 plus or minus 4,200 and some change genomes or SNP array data. So those are S SNP short for single nucleotide polymorphisms. These are just, it's sort of like instead of sequencing the whole genome, you have um, sort of a technique that allows you to, to just say, okay, re relative to a reference genome, in this case, a dog genome, what are the single nucleotide changes? And so um, you know, the genomes of the, the, I can't remember offhand the size of the dog genome, but we're talking, you know, into the gigabases of data per, um, per sample multiplied by thousands. Um, and the SNPs usually go into the millions, the hundreds of millions, as you're, um, just considering the 
differences, the variation in these genomes. It, I was going to say what is interesting is they have yeah. purebred dogs, right? Yeah. The ones you see in the shows, mixed breeds, free yeah. breeding, and wild dogs. <laughs> What a collection, huh? <laughs> yeah, and that's important. So, um, yeah, we're, we're these, these data is scattered out across 200 and plus known breeds, as you're pointing out, Vincent. I think um, 700 of them are mixed or unknown. This is like so. Yeah. This gets that that idea that um, in all of this um, selection, artificial selection for breeds, as people have said, you know, this is these are the sort of hallmark trades of what a golden retriever is to the to the real you know kennel club kind of collector yeah. level or the dog show people right that, that's then kicks off generations of selective breeding yeah and so i want to figure, show this beautiful this is a I great like, figure yeah. one right this <laughs> is their this is their canid genomic data set yeah that's right with some pictures of these guys i mean this is like elaine ostrander's like always her the the, the secret weapon at the start of a paper is you just show some dogs and immediately your audience yeah. is like, um, you know, eating out of but your hand. You can see the uh, the breakdown of the different kinds of, of dogs. We have, you know, mixed breeds, unknown breeds, pincher, schnauzer, et cetera, terriers, sheepdogs, spits, companion retrievers, sight hounds, pointing dogs, scent hounds, dachshunds, and wolf dogs. And then yep. geographically, we have them broken down on the left here. And so yeah. this this is a number. This gives you a sense of the numbers of each uh, genome we have right now and yeah, where great. they're from. Yeah, exactly. So pretty balanced data set. And then your point is a really important one, though, Vincent, which is that, you know, bringing in the mixed breeds, the unknown breeds, and then in particular, the wild canids. And so, you know, that kind of warms the heart of an evolutionist mm -hmm. in the sense that when you add that, you can start to try to make inferences about, OK, if there is sort of shared variation that yeah. might eventually be linked to these traits, like when did that originate? Where, you know, was that, did all of the selective breeding, um, you know, is it very late in the game that right. something like, you know, the ability to be one of these border collies that has this incredible ability to, to convince sheep to like go into a tiny little pen, like, did that happen just in the last, um, thousand years or is that you know is sort of the genetic architecture in place a lot earlier and so having those wild canids also those comparison points of unknown breeds to get a sense of like is you know where where is this variation how widespread is it or how specific is it to the more recent efforts to do selective breeding i was just see, watching a someone in my house was watching a video of them training mm. sheep dogs to yeah. herd sheep right so they have yeah. these dogs surrounding this herd of sheep. the sheep will not move right because they're yeah. scared of it but you can imagine that you got some dogs who are there focused on the sheep and then some are wandering off so they take those aside maybe that's their pets but they don't go into the breeding pool anymore so that's how over the hundreds of years this kind of selection works right <laughs> that's right i mean there's also you know maybe we're kind of like um hidden in plain sight is the other side of the coin here like what's the behavior like what makes you a, a dog show person right like why like that the human behavior here that you become yeah. you know it's almost like is that the equivalent of being a <laughs> of herding sheep is like <laughs> is breeding dog like something what's the genetic basis of being involved a member of the american kennel club uh being a little <laughs> you know <laughs> silly here but maybe to try to illustrate how slippery or difficult it really is to define and to kind of biologically categorize what yeah. a behavior is, especially when I think you're going for these pretty comp you know, complicated ones that aren't just sort of like, yeah, I mean, well, I mean, even the simple ones, like being a, a good companion, like for you, um, I mean, even as we as humans discuss this, like our definition of like a what companionship might be from a dog could be very different between two people and so yeah so obviously morphology is much easier right exactly than these behavioral traits right and they we'll see later that you know the morphology is related to fat yeah <laughs> that's right exactly right so we'll yeah and we'll also you know we'll go deeper into there is some this is that citizen science these these questionnaires that try to get at sort of a quantitative right. basis for some of this, but okay. So we've got a, you know, I think a pretty impressive data set here, the biggest, you know, um, to date and probably, you know, come back in a few years and it'll already be like 10 times as much data will be available or something. So how, what do you do when you have just sort of this endless, you know, like terabytes of data just sitting on, um, you know, some computer server somewhere, probably at, um, in Bethesda, Maryland, somewhere in the national institutes of health. So they use what's called this fate tool. So this is an attempt to, to um, get at 
or categorize sort of almost this principal components like analysis. What are the features kind of in high dimensionality of the data um, that sort of draws various groups together? And so FATE in particular, that, that's short, it's an acronym for potential of heat diffusion for affinity based transition embedding. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, <laughs> there's where I'm not going to try make a that, deep attempt here, but can I ask you, Nels? Yeah. They say it's a tool that encodes local and global data structure and high dimensional data mm -hmm. by transforming relationships among data points into diffusion probabilities that capture the likelihood of transition between states. What is high dimensional data? Yeah. So my set. So the high dimensional data, right, is that you have. Um, sort of shared features. In this case, it's just so like, like, let's be really specific here, right? So the data is A's, T's, C's, and G's. Mm -hmm. It's DNA, it's genomes. And so you can start to march across that genome and say, oh yeah, here's a change compared to like a reference, like the, the quote unquote dog, the, um, uh, which is adds an, there's another layer of complications here. But then pretty soon, you know, as you continue marching, you'll say, oh, well, here's another change. But this guy that looks a little bit different has this change, but not this one. All right. Now imagine, you know, imagine doing that millions of times or something like that as you go through billions of base pairs. And so um, the high dimensionality here is to like tease out what are the like relationships here um, in different, you know, so if you have this shared variation that might kind of put you together, but you lack variation there that might pull you apart. And so it's some some way to try to find uh, or to, to tease out those deeper relationships or the, the sort of layers of relationships based on shared variation. Okay. Okay. I don't know if, uh, if that made sense. Or yeah, it makes I sense. Have 100%, Just so folks that, know, FATE, whenever Nell says yeah. FATE, that's an acronym for this yes. computational approach they're using to look at these data. Yeah, yeah thank you. And that's spelled P-H-A-T-E, right. um, acronym for that, potential of heat diffusion. I mean, so this is kind of interesting, right? So the notion of diffusion, so that there's some, you know, there's also, I think this kind of hints at that there's some randomness in, or mm -hmm. noise in the data as well. And so right. you're trying to start of, you know, kind of categorize around the noise using the other sort of, you know, sort, sort of these physical principles actually that then are being adapted or repurposed for looking in this case right. at genetic relationships or genetic data. So, so let anyway, me show what you, you, let me show you yeah, one exactly. of these fate maps. Perfect. Right. Yeah. So this, these, these fate maps for the dogs start to look like these kind of hub and spoke situations. Right. And each of the dots is a genome, um, and or in the data set or a SNP, um, uh, uh, results from a SNP array, which again, sort of quantifies or catalogs the variation from a, a, a reference in terms of single nucleotide polymorphism. And so then what you can do is like, so the data sets are color or the dots are color coordinated. Right. And so, um, based on sort of that, um, you know, max, I guess what they call the lineage. Um, uh, what am I missing this here? So the red to the, to the blue. So the, the warmer, the color, the more sort of uh, relationship there is here between this. And so, you know, this is where um, at each point of the, or each sort of tip of the spoke, are a set of points that actually are like these kind of American Kennel Club sort of situations. So the terriers, the retrievers, the, uh, pointers and spaniels, the scent hounds, you kind of go around here. And then as you go deeper into those um, sort of the um, hub area of the fate map, P-H-A-T-E map, that's where, um, you know, some of these uncharacterized or mixed breeds or unknown mm. breeds, they've got a little, like there's a genetic contribution from sort of across the different breeds. There can also be, you know, convergence here on shared variation, not because of lineage by descent or um, relationship identity by descent, which would be sort of that just sort of generation to generation. Who are your parents? Were they more closely related to, you know, um, who, the next person's parents kind of thing? And so anyway, so, you know, why go through all this trouble actually when you could just do sort of a phylogenetic comparison, which is right, like right. literally, do, you know, to try to um, tease out. And so their point is that there are, um, especially as they're starting to think about these complex traits, that it's not always sort of lineage by descent, that there's going to be genetic sort of fingerprints or there'll be convergence, there'll be sort of hidden relationships in the data set, that there's enough variation here, um, both between sort of the, um, you know, the free breeding and the very, um, 
um, sort of purposeful breeding that goes on in the diversification of the dog species. And so um, um, Canis familiaris, the dog species. Okay, so um, yeah, so these are these projections and the hubs are these, the, I wish they would have spent a little more time to be honest, going in a little bit of that sort of kind of comparing this to the phylogenetics, but just as sort of a 50,000 foot view, um, more of the hub region is what they're in, are saying are the inferred ancestral genomes. Mm -hmm. um, and how you get to that sort of ancestral state, given that it's all modern data sets, right? Whether it's from, you know, so certainly um, there's some inference being made by like what's common among the wild breeds, the ones that haven't been domesticated. And as you get more derived or there's more artificial selection, that gets you out onto those tips of the spokes. And that's where, you know, the sort of top scoring American Kennel Club retrievers hang out, for example, mm -hmm. just to say that's not just a single breed out there. So that's like the retrievers, for example, that encompasses a number of breeds. Um, but again, sh like sort of they kind of come together as being um, at, at, at more closely related. I think it was, I found this interesting that they yeah. said the herder lineage, right? These herder dogs mm -hmm. traverses through livestock guarding breeds, so dogs that take care of livestock, uh, and that gives rise to mastiffs on one trajectory and yeah. cattle drovers on the other, culminating in sheepdogs, which they say suggests that sheepdogs are the most genetically diverged from the ancestral state of the lineage. In other words, what was yeah. the original ancestral state of the canids. It's quite interesting, right? You can you can get that from this information. I agree. And so that's kind of, the, that would be what the, I think they would hold up and say, like, this is the reason to do it, right? Is so yeah. they can, once they have this catalog, and we're looking at it here on the, you know, on the PDF in two dimensions, you can draw this in three dimensions. You can add more, you can add more dimensions and try to tease out these relationships. But then once they have that, then you can start to do this analysis on top of it, which are these pseudo temporal reconstructions. And that gets at the point that you just made, right? So they're trying to kind of you know, are there, is there enough signal here, even in the genetic relationship, to start to kind of, you know, propose stories about, okay, yeah, like just as you said, like what's the hit to get out to the sheepdogs? What mm -hmm. kind of, you know, what genetic stocks were, were happening or exchanging genetics over time or interbreeding over time to end up with today's yep. sort of um, slightly stereotyped behaviors uh, that they're hoping to get a genetic handle on? And so that's, I think, you know, the real... Um, you know, potential payoff here of doing this kind of analysis is that you start to calculate what's called pseudo time. Like you're trying to work through not just what you see today, but how did you get there? And are there sort of hidden relationships that become exposed? Now, of course, the big question is you can, you can do that with these techniques. Is that really what happened? And unfortunately, we don't have a time machine technology at our fingertips yet. And so you can't, you know, kind of confirm that with, with uh, experimental. Right. And so I see that as like kind of a challenge for the field is to sort of say, okay, how do we say, you know, the robustness on some of these measures? I think that's, you know, it's kind of cooked in there to some level if you really dig in, but to really, as you start to make these stories about, okay, how does, what does this mean for the trajectory or the, the breeding pools, the populations that some of these breeds move through um, easier said than confirmed. I would say. Yep. Yep. They also looked at the ge the geographical contribution to besides this functional, right? That we just yeah, described. exactly. There's a geographical contribution, of course, because different areas that do, the dogs are established and they get bred there. They don't. A dog in Europe is not typically going to be bred with the U.S. and vice versa. So you see these axes of variation uh, between the east and the west, right? Exactly right. Yeah. And so, you know, that's actually one way to, or sort of a complementary set of data that sort of gives you maybe a little bit of confidence that the kind of patterns that you're seeing here or proposing mm -hmm. um, make some sense. So if it was like, you know, oh, there's no geographical signal here at all in the, in the sort of right. high dimensionality analysis, that would make you pretty skeptical that you were sort of doing this because certainly where, yeah, the locations that you're in sort of hold an echo to the interbreeding that likely happened. And so, yeah, you know, at least, you know, some makes you feel like that there's some signal here that there is, you know, sort of some complementarity in the data when you, when you put it on the geographical map and just as you're saying. And in particular, the, the wild dogs, right? The yeah. free breeding ones show the most geographical stratification as you'd expect, right? Because the That's others right. could be carried back and forth for breeding purposes and so forth, right? Absolutely. Yeah. The same way humans now are like in modern days, like we're just flying all over the place and yep. humans are humans. Same with these dog breeds as well. Yeah. We're flying all over and breeding everywhere, Nels. 
<laughs> that's right. Exactly. That's, um, that's what mammals do. Um, okay. So, <laughs> so they've got that kind of, you know, gives try is the, um, the work to map out on the genetic side of things here. Um, <clears throat> but then let's now add the thread of the behavioral side, right? So, um, and this gets at that citizen science. So there's this questionnaire, it's called the CBARC, which is, um, Again, another acronym, it's um, C-B-A-R-Q, -B mm -hmm. Canine Behavioral Assessment and Research <laughs> Questionnaire. <laughs> that's good. I love it. Yeah, that's a, good, that's a great one. C-Bark. Um, and um, I'm not a dog owner myself, so I haven't come across it. But um, I think, like, I, what about you, Vincent? Like, if you were, if you, if you had dogs, would you participate in the C-Bark Questionnaire? Try to... Um... Well, actually, we have dogs, but we haven't participated in this. <laughs> ah, Yeah. <laughs> I don't what even know do about it. <laughs> what breeds do you have? We have a we have a a mixed breed, uh, a purposely mixed breed, right? A Morky, which is a cross between a Maltese and a Yorkie, and then we have a purebred a dog which originated in Madagascar that didn't fall into this paper. It's called a Coton de Tuliar. Very wow. interesting uh, breed, but um, not here. But it would be interesting to know because they have uh, obviously been. Uh, spread worldwide and so uh, huh. that, that would be an interesting study on its own but i don't think they had any in this data set interesting yeah 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 um which just illustrates again like how much diversity <laughs> there is among dogs and yeah like, this is just sort of like the tip of the iceberg yeah but so anyway yeah so if you um filled out the sea bark um and they have data <laughs> um they note from forty six thousand purebreds in this case um, and from this, this data, uh, they derive 14 numeric phenotype scores. Um, and so now, you know, this feel it's not genetic data, but this is big data again. Now in terms of the, um, you know, numerical scores, you're trying to quantify here, some of these, these phenotypes and in particular, the behavioral phenotypes. So, um, you know, l let me just read off a few of these. So there's um, dog directed fear. Are they, or is the dog afraid of other dogs? Uh, <laughs> non-social fear, predatory chasing, um, owner directed aggressiveness, uh, familiar dog aggressiveness, touch sensitivity, trainability, energy, stranger directed aggression, stranger directed fear, excitability, um, attachment in attention seeking dog directed aggression and separation problems, relationship problems. So those are the four. And then you, you know, based on your breed, you give scores and then you, you can sort of do almost like kind of, you know, almost phylogenetic like analysis to try to um, correlate this and do that same pseudo time analysis. So they show a heat map where this is in, in figure three, um, or now they're trying to get a sense of, um, yeah. What are the hidden patterns in this data between breeds and having 46,000 times four or 13 or 14 traits, phenotypes, that's a lot of data to crunch. So actually they go back to the fate um, tool and try to tease out some of these, um, you know, um, components or the dimensionality in there. They run pseudo time. So now you're asking, you know, the question, not how are these genetic relatedly, but are there behavioral threads um, as these breeds um, became pure as they, as you go out of the wild canids, the, the free breeding and move into the purebreds, are there patterns here, overlaps or sort of some of the, the shared features that might emerge? I love so. some of these correlations between <laughs> breeds and behaviors, right? Yeah. Like yeah. the terrier is largely clustered in the bottom left, consistent with predatory behavior and dog directed aggression while pre both companion and toy dogs clustered to the right with increased social and non-social fear. So if you like dogs and you have one, um, you will see that uh, maybe your dog's behavior is in here. <laughs> no, absolutely. And so, and, and that's what, in, you know, to get that citizen science, um, you know, how do you quantify that? I mean, there is, so yeah. I don't know the Steve yeah. well enough, but you know, a big part of that is to try to get people to judge their dogs consistently right. as individuals right across sure. the data that gets complicated too in the environment that these dogs are bred in or brought up in is probably going to obviously influence of some of these behaviors as well aggressiveness towards other etc and so yeah this is where you know uh, i could see really, that 
I could see if you have a dog a number of years, you could spot this behavior. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, what are the, I mean, it's kind of interesting to think about like, what are the cutoffs for like, what's a quality report on yeah. any individual breed? Um, this also, I think really nicely hints at the, um, you know, going back again to the wild dogs or the free breeding ones is, you know, a lot of these behaviors are going to be sort of cooked in to what it meant to be a dog, not just mm -hmm. over, you know, sort of domestication by humans, but in, um, as wild animals. And so like a lot of predatory behavior comes in here. And then does that, how does that get sort of reprogrammed is the, you know, one idea, excuse me, as you go through the selective breeding, as you become domesticated. So it's sort of echoes of this natural behavior that then is thought to be favorable to the breeders. Now, you know, and yeah. this is a whole yeah. range of people, people who want to do dog fights all the way to people who want to sort of cuddle on the couch with a toy breed. Here are a couple of others that I found interesting. Uh, as you might expect, a lot of overlap uh, between different lineages. Like trainability was generally increased among herder, pointer, spaniel, and retriever breeds. Yeah. Uh, increased trainability was broadly a feature of working and sporting breeds. The most significant positive correlations were between herder and non-social fear and terriers and predatory chasing. So if you have a terrier, you're probably saying, ah, yes, my terrier is always chasing things. We, yeah. <laughs> so the Morky we have is a part terrier, always wants to go out and chase little things. Always. <laughs> Never gets them, but that's yep. what's baked into that breed, right? Yeah, I love it. I love that description. <laughs> yeah. And so that's, you know, I think this is so, and then, you know, what you really try to do here with this kind of analysis, data analysis, is to is to really identify like how deep are those connections or how like how consistent or solid is that. Mm -hmm. And so this is where I think, you know, there's that really kind of subtle or that, that handoff almost between our intuition where it's like that makes sense. And there's some real signal in that. There's some real information in that. But then, you know, how to judge that when you try to then link that or associate it with the genetics, that really becomes sort of the million dollar question, question here. So you get um, a, a few of the big picture patterns that fall out immediately. So as they start to think about like, what are the variants here? So going back, flipping back to the genetics, you know, they point out that many of the variants that they identify um, are um, at moderate allele frequency. So, oh, and I should say, I'm kind of skipped over. So this is um, now figure four. So they want to correlate these traits to the breeds and the scores and that kind of analysis, and then perform GWAS analysis. So this is genome -wide, a genome-wide association study um, and they decided, you know, maybe somewhat arbitrarily, but just like you can only handle so much information. The top 100 genetic loci that are associated with these behavioral scores per breed, per behavioral sort of, um, you know, of the 14 traits here. Okay. So, and then, yeah. So what are the big picture connections here? And so, and maybe just to say a little bit about the G, um, G, G, GWAS, genome-wide association studies, right? So what you're trying to do is um, figure out, is there, you know, based on the shared genetics, and that could be just in a single breed, or maybe it's between a couple of breeds, um, does that, is there a shared genetic location mm -hmm. um, or a loci that if you have this variation at that loci, at that location in the genome, that that correlates really well with you're probably going to score high on this trait for the terriers you're chasing around mice or squirrels <laughs> not catching them and so and so these are this is correlation now and so like and it's, it's sort of tempting in a lot of cases to try to move really quickly to sort of a causative explanation um, a lot easier said than done and then also remember that you know so you're correlating this often with a single nucleotide polymorphism and so we may know on the genetic side, we may know like, okay, you know, if this hits um, a gene coding region that changes the amino acid, that changes the function of that protein, there might be sort of a sort of direct line into, oh, wow, yeah, if you have this sort of change, here's the biology that might explain that trait. This gets really murky or really murky is maybe the wrong word, but it's it complicated here because, you know, this isn't, it's a lot easier to say, here's a change, like a non-coding change in a protein that means that it's, you don't get that pigment into the cell the way and so the color is different on the mm. you know code of, and so that's those simple yeah. you know the difference between the simple um, single or very low complexity genetic situations with high um, impact um, that you know is all of the difference versus you know so you can we can identify these hundred genes or the variation in and around them but then 
how does that feed into, you know, that the sort of predilection of a terrier to chase a squirrel? Okay, so um, as a result, you end up with kind of, you know, maybe not that you don't drill in as much to those sort of like explanations and certainly not a, a sort of a causative scenario here, but you look at patterns. And so this is what the authors do. And I think they do a nice job of sort of, you know, floating above here a little bit and trying to pull out some of the bigger themes. So many of the variants that they find, so these are the ones that are correlated most highly, the genetic variation, the um, nucleotide changes are correlated most highly with the behavioral scores or shared behavioral scores across the data set are at are alleles that are at moderate frequency and, and sort of across the board. So um, they're not unique to any single breed. So it's like, you know, that terrier might really express this, but a lot of the same genetic underpinnings are in some of the other breeds as well. And so this is kind of consistent with that variation has been around for a long time, right? If it's shared among all of the breeds that have gone on these sort of, mm -hmm. gone out on different tips of different spokes, the fact that all that variation exists um, is consistent with the idea um, that, you know, even in the, um, you know, the um, feral, semi-feral dogs, the village dogs or the, the mixed breeds or the um, even the wild canids um, as you see this that means that you're sort of like that existed that all yeah. of the sort of genetic substrates were already um before relatively in place. we started breeding in modern times basically right exactly yeah. yeah so i think that leaves open the question it's like okay well why is this so exaggerated this behavior or that behavior yeah. in one breed or another and i think that's where the you know complexity of the biology might really start to um kind of um, cloud things up a bit um and so, yeah, you know, and this also actually probably speaks, I think they also note that, um, you know, maybe this pushes back <laughs> how long humans have been domesticating dogs and actually breeding on these behaviors. So mm -hmm. this sort of brings the sight hounds, the retrievers and the scent hounds that share a lot of this variation sort of maybe kind of secretly into some of these same categories. Their ancestors were going through a lot of the same um, you know, selective breeding situations um, that continue to get even more sophisticated yeah. um, in modern times. And by the okay. way, these are these changes are largely non-coding, right? Yeah. So that was another. That's always that's <laughs> one of the big questions about like in, in the field of evolution is does <laughs> does um, natural selection act most commonly on regulatory variation or non-coding variation? versus the coding variation, the actual sequences that encode for the amino acids of proteins. And so, you know, when we're thinking about um, host pathogen interactions, host virus interactions, oftentimes we see these, these protein coding changes, the receptor for a virus, and then mm. the virus is spike protein and these sort yeah, of cat and yeah. mouse chases, right? We're, Here, spoiled, the, we're spoiled by those, right? We are, and it kind of like exactly, it kind of <laughs> speaks to the simplicity of the phenotype you're scoring, which is, you know, how sick are you? And that, there's didn't some massive we, advantages. Didn't yeah. we just do a paper where there were mainly non-coding changes involved in what we were looking at? Do you remember? Yeah, Oh, ooh, I'm not, I don't know if I'm going to pull this up immediately, but yeah, well, we've done a number of them. And honestly, you know, I think if in the field, more studies end up shading towards the non-coding variants being sort of the underlying cause. And so you sort of like, instead of changing the proteins that exist, you, you express them at different times or in different places and different tissues. And a lot of adaptation sort of works pretty naturally there. I think um, it was uh, the Black Death. Oh yeah, susceptibility. Yeah, yeah. Which, that was mo mostly non-coding. Yeah. Yeah. So even in the host pathogen, even the host, you know, in this case, bacteria, or the yeah. even the yeah, even in those cases, there's a lot of space for non-coding variation to come at play. Part of that is because you know, once you have a protein that works, it's like messing with that is sort of a high-stakes game. Most mutations are deleterious, and so if you're just sort of nibbling at, oh yeah, well let, we'll keep the protein the same, but let's add it to this tissue or this set of cells, or what about in this sort of developmental window? Um, that might be sort of an easier path for evolution to kind of yeah. tinker with along yep. the way. Yep. And so yeah, I think you're exactly right, Vince. I'm glad you raised the point. So I think it's only like 1% of their SNPs that they identified. So they identify 15,000 variants. Only 76 of them are coding variants. And so, you know, the massive 14,000 900 are um, non-coding, um, so that you know they're in with, um, and they're 
looking for ones that might be in promoters or enhancer regions, right. ones that might actually change the expression of the gene that's in the okay. that's nearby in the genome, and that that might sort of influence the behavior based on when the proteins or the transcriptional you know fac the transcription factor is sort of kicked on at time and place. So you know, there's other massive data um, sort of sets available to look at this. The ENCODE data set. Um, is one mm -hmm. um, a little bit underdeveloped for dogs, but that's where they they can start to even make some maybe tenuous, but um, you know some connections to humans and mice, for example. And so um, this is where they start to point the results towards um, kind of developmental <clears throat> um, changes in neurodevelopment, the development of the brain. And of course, again, this sort of makes intuitive sense that when we think about behaviors, where are these things coming from? Um, you know, you're firing off a bunch of neurons. You have all these synaptic connections that are somehow then you yeah. know, driving yeah. the behavior. And so, of course, you know, makes um, pretty clear intuitive, uh, intuitive sense. Um, seeing some of those shared variants in the ENCODE data for humans and mice, I think actually speaks to that bigger picture. When we think about behaviors um, related, let's say, to like just how you interact with other dogs or other mm -hmm. sort of your own species versus um, strangers, how you think about like predatory behavior and aggression. This is, you know, obviously um, cooked into the evolution of all mammals, ourselves included. And so, um, so yeah, so I think they can draw some, you know, some connections for sure. Now, here's where I want to kind of pause for a second and just say that, you know, I think there are some potential pitfalls with just layering. So a lot of times when you're um, looking at the variation here, you're doing it not for like a specific single gene, but for an entire pathway, right? right so there are, right. you know, a lot of our biology, a lot of our development has been characterized into these sort of shared collections of, of genes that encode proteins that might be involved in a behavior or a certain, you know, aspect of our cell biology, um, you know, like our immune systems, like there's, a, there's like probably f hundreds of categories that try to describe specific immune, biological immune responses um, that are encoded by collections of genes. And so um, kind of already cooked into this, right, is that we're taking all of this raw data, which is just too overwhelming to kind of even imagine like any kind of reductionist mm. approach, but we're layering kind of category comparisons between categories and we're layering mm. those comparisons on top of each other again. And so for me, at least, it's always just like a kind of a moment to kind of step back and say, you know, what are we really learning here? We're drawing, we're cataloging, we're drawing comparisons. And I think getting some broad themes, but that sort of next step of really drilling into specific insights or understandings about like what is the real, you know, what's the real functional consequence of this change? Really difficult question, really interesting question, um, but one that you can't just sort of snap your fingers and it sort of falls into place. Well, it? for that, you need to do uh, experiments, right? And mm. dogs are hard, harder to do. It's not, <laughs> it's not a mouse, right? So yeah. it doesn't have a. It's right. fast generation time, easy, easily bred and so forth. So uh, people don't typically do these kinds of experiments on dogs. So it may end up not going much farther than this. I agree. So or so I think that that's for this specific line of research for this paper. I 100 percent agree with you. And by the way, I don't think the authors, you know, picked up a pipetter here and, and no. good for them. Like they're, you know, this is a lot of your and not to belittle the study at all. Like the amount of yeah, analysis sure. is super impressive, but, yep. but yeah. So I think the question then becomes like, will someone read this or see this or, or hear this? <laughs> so this is one of the reasons we pod, like we want to talk about this, right. Is to get this kind of information, this curiosity in front of more, as many people as possible, because then that might inspire someone to say, oh, actually, given that little tidbit of information, sure, sure. that reminds me that in this, you know, these behavioral trials that we're doing in mice or whatever it is, that we saw this thing. And so now you might use some of this information to actually set up a perturbation based approach or, you know, as we're talking about some of the advantages of host pathogen interactions, like, uh, you know, I think a really interesting allied field here, which is how do pathogens change the behavior of their hosts? There you can start to do really, you know, you can kind of perturb the system, in this case, adding the pathogen or subtract, and then saying, how does that influence? So I think this is worth a lot, but it, in and of itself alone, I don't, you know, you, just like, you know, there's only so far you can go, basically, with this. Of course. Kind of course. Right. Yeah, agreed. I just want to add that, so that looking at where these changes are possibly acting 
Many of them are in, as you said, neurodevelopmental stages, right? Which mm. makes sense in terms of behavioral phenotypes that we're looking at, right? Yeah. In ter terms of trainability and going after little critters and so forth. But there was one I found interesting. Uh, the most, And they say the most significant enrichment was for subcutaneous adipose consistent with selective breeding aimed at morphology. So yeah. uh, a different set of changes that affect fat and that makes the, the dog attractive or not, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's really interesting too. That reminds me a little bit of, um, so some of the pigeon work actually. So there are these weird, and speaking of behavior, so there are these pigeons called rollers. And mm -hmm. um, when they try to fly, I think Mike was telling us about this on Twebo 7, they, instead of flying, like they, they're kind of messed up in their behavior and they end up rolling. And then breeders think this is like interesting and they race rollers against each other. But so some of the genes are um, variants are being identified there. And then it's being linked to genes that in humans have been involved in like addictive behaviors. So again, it's sort of like these like interesting sort of connections drawn. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, in the adipose case, like you can kind of see how um, artificial selection is sort of like, you know, you get the rough outlines of what might be going on here and then how that feeds into other biology that in kind of interesting and maybe unexpected for ways. For sure. For sure. Um, Okay, but yeah, so they do actually do one kind of deeper dive here, and that is with the sheepdogs. So they give yeah, us this one, is very cool. <laughs> yeah, so let's do this. Let's go down this rabbit hole with them a little bit yeah. and see where we end up, right? Okay, so um, um, because just as you're saying, I mean, my God, neurodevelopment is massively complicated, and the times and places happening. So can how far can we go down the rabbit hole? Maybe is how you, how to set this up. So they propose one specific connection. This is from the sheepdog data, and in particular, some of that herding behavior again. So the herding and, behavior, by the way, is easy to define, as they say, right? Yeah. So this this is very interesting and and easy to observe an extinctive herding drive. Uh, so it, it's not it's a good phenotype to study. I agree. Yeah. And like golden retrievers aren't doing it right. They're just sort of, um, you know, yeah, just yeah. Uh, on your lap hanging out and, and panting at you. So yeah, well, they're so, good. They're good at retrieving stuff. Right. But <laughs> they are. I grew up with a golden retriever, so I'm not trying to like cast shadows on this guy. I love, I love them. Um, okay. So their GWAS comes back then with one of these functional categories. And what's kind of interesting is so, you know, and again, grain of salt, but so it's in specific to axon guidance. And so this is kind of interesting, right? Again, at least from sort of an intuitive standpoint, which is, so you, as axons, these are the projections coming out of neurons in the brain. And as the brain's developing, you can imagine that, um, you know, if your axons are being influenced to make different connections or a specific set of connections, maybe that underlies some of the behavior. And so I think that's kind of the hypothesis here. So what is, so if and they dig in and they, in addition to saying that that's the category, they actually identify, okay, here are the genes and the changes um, in or around them, those non-coding SNPs. So eight of them are axon guidance receptors. And so if you're changing, if there's a, a, a shared variation here um, that's consistent with having this herding behavior in the sheepdogs, then, you know, there, is there something happening with these eight receptors that maybe they're expressed at a different developmental time window and or on a different set of neurons, in which case that would influence then some of these axon to syn uh, connections to make synapses between right. neurons, right? Okay. And then there's also four, similarly, there's um, four axon guidance cues that have some of this um, linked or associated variation in two GTPAs activating proteins. And so here, you know, they're kind of starting to drill in a little bit and say that, well, maybe, you know, this kind of um, this, these changes influence the development of the, in, in different brain regions that lead to the hypothesis that, um, that this, um, you know, behavior involves vision and motor behavior by axon sorting at, at the optic chiasm. OK, so starting to try to actually put some of that variation into um, a specific brain region and to make the case that there's some kind of a connection here between um, binocular vision and motor behavior, that somehow these, you know, these um, sheepdogs are wired up through the way they're looking at the world um, to influence their behavior here. I don't know. I mean, to me, it sounds like it's intuitively it's a very attractive idea based on some other data They go even a little bit farther. So they pick one gene, which is the efferin receptor, a gene called EPHA5. 
And to just sort of illustrate, like to, you know, give one example of what do we you know, mean by an association? So the variant in the Ephrin receptor, again, this is one of those um, um, axon guidance receptors, one of the eight. So the variant that they identify is in 77% of the border collies in their data set and only mm -hmm. 7% in other breeds. And so that's kind of the correlation, right? That's the kind mm -hmm. of data that they're trying to compile here down to the now the single SNP change. Um, and so then, you know, it's sort of, you know, linking the trying to turn back the history, linking like you go even a little bit farther to sort of link some of these traits to anxiety. Um, and, and so, sorry, so, you know, the Ephrin receptor is even more studied in mice. Mm -hmm. and so what right. is some of the variation in, the, in this specific Ephrin receptor? How does that play out in terms of mouse behavior? And is there a link to draw here, even sort of a deeper evolutionary link? And so among mice, some of the variation in that specific gene or around it, the regulation of that gene is linked to anxiety and to maternal pup gathering associations. Right. And so here's kind of this cool evolutionary idea that if you take anxiety and you and with this impulse to like herd your, your mouse pups in a sense, yeah, yeah. that maybe that trait has been kind of repurposed or wired among the sheepdogs, the border collies, um, and that you have this combination of anxiety and protective behavior that then explains that, like, you know, impulse to herd sheep into those at the sort of dog show or the dog competition. I swear we, we have done a paper, I don't know if it was on this podcast or another, about uh, maternal pup gathering in mice mm -hmm. and its genetic regulation. It doesn't strike, it doesn't ring a bell here, does it, uh, Nelson? No, I don't think we did it, but um, yeah. Um, it's very interesting. It's very yeah, interesting. I agree. And I kind of like this idea of, you know, so from this kind of hint, like this is a theme I think that you've seen a lot of evolution is that you don't sort of like create an entire behavior from space scratch that's right right that's but right. The evolution takes existing modules or complexes or patterns and then brings them together in different combinations that then you mm -hmm. select on something that already exists in a new way and that you know that i think increasingly we're seeing that that underlies for example you know origins of multicellularity a lot of the parts list are already in those ancestral you know, per, you know that split off before animals emerged from a last common ancestor right. these kind of things right. yeah so that's I, I, it. I, I think there's some nice uh, themes that we have here. And, and I think, so one of their conclusions is we have now, using dogs, which for the reasons we mentioned earlier, right, we've been yeah. breeding them for certain behaviors for many thousands of years, we make a system for understanding how behavior is encoded in genomes. And this is, as, as Nell said, it's not yeah. easy to do because behavior is not like coat color. It's going to be multigenically controlled. So here we have a system where we can start to get at that. And so they show the central role that behavior has been, been playing in the diversification of the canine lineage, right? We can yeah. associate a lot of these changes with the, the behaviors that we've talking about. But they also point out uh, that when you have a complex trait like behavior, selection pressure is inefficient because... Um, not, it's not enough to have one locus control. It's going to be multiple yeah. loci control because there's going to be multiple levels of control. And yeah. so uh, all of these things that we're talking about in terms of behavior is not going to be easy. You're not going to make a single change and change the behavior of a, of a dog, for example. It's going to be more than that. Yeah. Th yep. And, yeah, I, and, and I, think, I think the other lesson, uh, which – well, there's two things. that Most of this diversification in dogs is driven by non-coding variants. Right? Yeah. which is really yeah. cool. And the origins of the behavior of most of the dogs that we see today preceded or predated domestication. That is, they were present in wolves already yeah. thousands of years ago. I think that's very cool. Yeah, I agree <laughs> with you. Um, so, um, you know, I get, you know, for the aficionados in the field, I wonder how, I, I doubt there'd be a lot of surprises in this. Um, and so, you know, the field of behavioral genetics and evolutionary behavioral genetics, there haven't been those, like, or very few home runs. Um, we had Hopi Hoekstra on Twivo. Their, her lab is doing some really exciting work on some of the behaviors in mice, um, not in field mice in particular, paramiscus, so not just the mus musculus clade, but sort of trying to use or develop the genetic tools to actually make these sort of, you know, more to not just generate the hypothesis, but to test it um, with things like 
behaviors like building complicated burrows and stuff underground and things like that. Um, so yeah, so I think, you know, not too surprising probably for the field that there's going to be lots of small effect loci at play influencing these traits, as you're pointing out, very different than some of the morphological stuff you can do with artificial selection in, in dogs and or pigeons. I mean, I think there are some really nice, and, and the authors, I think, do a nice job of sort of stating some of the advance here, though, specific advances here. So I think the spinoffs are, you know, kind of some new ways of describing the relationships between dog breeds. This got me mm -hmm. kind of, um, by using the, um, you know, the high dimensionality analysis, the kind of principal components plus or the diffusion, diffusion modeling that even mm -hmm. comes into this. So like, are there any hidden, I'd be curious, like if, if for you know, the, the sort of pros here to look at that, look at these kind of data sets. Are there like kind of weird predictions that might come up? Like, you know, could you enter, could you ever enter a Chihuahua in a border collie herding contest and somehow it might like as, you know, surprisingly do well mm -hmm. when, you, when you go to, <laughs> I don't know if you can make any predictions like that, or, you know, I certainly I think the gold retrievers, yeah, would not, yeah, yeah. they would just sort of lay on their back and want to be pet or something like that. But that's maybe, cool. you know, there's who knows if that's hiding in there. Um, I think this also, as you're pointing out, like some nice insight a little bit into the demography. Um, they point out, I think, a really, really nice cautionary tale to be a little bit cautious about looking through the lens of everything being through natural or artificial selection, that there's still drift um, in a lot of genetic variation that probably doesn't have sort of the functional consequences that you might just sort of predict from looking at yeah. it. Yeah. Um, that's an, yeah. an important point that comes out nicely. Um, then as you're saying, the non-coding variants, they do, you know, mm -hmm. there is, there are some holes in the analysis. So they don't look at any kind of copy number variation or structural changes in the genomes, which are certainly in there, but just not sort of, you know, even in the conversation based on the genome mm -hmm. sequencing or the SNP array technology that they use. So, um, yeah, in the end, I think it was like really fun, sort of like a holiday inspired theme here. The dogs that we'll all be hanging out with over the holidays and probably, yeah, that's right. you know, what, curling up with a cup of coffee in front of the television or something. Um, and I, maybe I'd, I'll close my um, podcast peer review here with pretty remarkable that three, <laughs> three authors pulled this off. When you look at a lot of these yeah, it's you know, amazing. genome yeah. scale papers, right? Usually the author yeah. list is as long as someone's genome. It's like hundreds of authors. And so in particular, I like you know, that. Yeah. yeah, I agree. A shout out to Emily Dutro, the first author who kind of a heroic um, amount of analysis, bringing all of this data together, analyzing it in these sophisticated ways and sort of proposing these interesting and provocative hypotheses. We've got some good questions here. Let's take some of them. Yeah, so great. Uh, Les says Darwin studied pigeon artificial selection. Yeah, right? yeah, that's right. And so, yeah, uh, Mike uh, walked us through a little bit of that history, that fun history that goes all the way to Charles Darwin. Very cool. How that cool. kind of was in the conversation when, when um, you know, the origins of the species and the idea of natural selection was sort of being yeah. um, articulated for some of the first times. Yeah. So John asks, can all dogs detect mm. cancer? So uh, this is interesting. So some dogs have been trained to smell uh urine of cancer patients and detect yeah. that yep. but i think it's only been done with certain breeds as far as i know so i don't yeah, I'm know guessing this i'm guessing the scent hounds right might be the ones most that likely was, yeah the yeah. ones that some of the ones we studied in this uh paper as well yeah yep yeah there's another um drawing that connection between cancer there's a tweevo i won't be able to place the episode right off but we of um so not dogs detecting cancer but dogs transmitting cancers oh yeah um yeah. These transmissible <laughs> infectious cancers, some of them um, venereal tumors spread through sexual contact. And a super fascinating study that we covered a couple of years back, Vincent, remember, where, you know, basically some of the mutational patterns in the cancer, the tumors that were being sequenced sort of matched. For example, like if the dog was living near the equator, it was more likely to have mm -hmm. signatures of UV damage than if it was a dog right. that was located near the poles. All these like kind of interesting genetic relationships wow. <laughs> in these We've had some good aspects. programs on this podcast, right? Yeah, 85 strong. We're um, just picking up steam. Yeah. <laughs> so Ian says, uh, New Zealand used to get laughed at for a really popular TV program, a dog show. It was farmers and their dogs competing to herd sheep. Collies didn't bark, huntaways did. That's cool. I That's love very it. cool. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I had a blast going to one of these <laughs> sheep herding contests, border collie herding con like. Um, it was just like a great afternoon. Um, yeah. And it's like the whole, um, sort of lifestyle around whether it's dog breeding, pigeon breeding, or like chicken breeding, farming, 
um, the, when it gets competitive, when humans impulse to compete on some of these things, it, like things get pretty wild in a hurry. Now, in Germany, some people breed 13 line squirrels. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Rob, uh, have leak proof have indeed taken a huge toll role in dog evolution, but cats remain mostly in control of their genetic options. <laughs> That's Maybe, right. Uh, actually, he rephrased this. Humans play a major role in dog evolution, but cats prefer to make their own genetic yeah. choices. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I don't know. Is that really true? I, I just don't know enough about um, the um, sort of – I mean, certainly like um, there are cat shows as well, right? And there's very, you know, programs of artificial breeding. But yeah. like, the scale of that, how that compares, I just don't know. But um, certainly like, you know, the notion of – I mean, I'm also um, up until very recently a cat owner as well. And so the notion that they're like these independent spirits that are like ignoring you, I, I've, I can speak to that um, anecdotally as well. Although I think I just read something recently that, you know, cats like pretend like they're not listening to you, but they're actually, they are. They totally perceive you. They're just choosing to ignore you. And so maybe that fits <laughs> Rob's point here I as think, well. I mean, we do breed <laughs> cats for certain qualities, but I think not as extensively as dogs. That's That would be my non-expert take on this that's fascinating the differences though yeah that, that's a cool uh, vanity has joined us thank you another moderator thank you welcome for, yeah for great, joining great us to have you here uh, and janine has joined us uh, made a live chat yeah. thanks for coming appreciate um, it uh maureen says yes microbe and twiv need to be more well known the 30 minute <laughs> twiv ex excerpts will help suggest mm -hmm. episode titles reflect the topic yeah some of our twiv titles are kind of cute and they don't Reflect oh, the yeah. title. The topic. You can tell when I have made up the title because it more <laughs> closely reflects the yeah. topic because I'm a straight shooter. Yeah. <laughs> so here, yeah, good points, Marine. So the top, the title we've been playing around with for this episode currently is um, "Teaching Old Dogs New Genetic Tricks." I think that's kind. Of, that's good. I mean, <laughs> there would be a more straightforward one, but I'm not sure it would make much of a difference. <laughs> All right, but Tom says, yeah. he, go ahead, sorry, Mel. Go ahead. Oh, no, no, keep going, keep going. This is great. Let's keep running. Uh, Tom said, here I'm reminded of a 1990s project that involved some faculty I knew who were crossing border collies mm. in Newfoundland's for behavioral study. They were geneticists who don't know what became yeah. of it. Okay. Yeah, this, that's right, Tom. So I think Elaine Ostrander was involved in this. And there were, and so, you know, speaking about this is kind of like Citizen Science Plus, where there are a number of, um, you know, um, dog owners slash geneticists um, who, Probably, you know, geneticists who weren't necessarily studying dogs at all, but um, yeah. were kind of drawn into um, some of this um, sort of intriguing. So um, Jasper Ryan at Berkeley was also involved in this. Um, and um, man, I'm yeah, I'm blanking on the details a little bit here, too. But so a number of people like actually, you know, maybe didn't do the breeding, but like actually, you know, became owners of the dogs that were in that scheme to try to get at. Um, yeah, by doing so, that's how you can, you know, going beyond the genetic, um, the GWAS, the genome wide association studies, if you do a little bit of um, sort of purposeful breeding, then you can start to map traits is the idea using sort of traditional yeah. genetic approaches. And I think, I think they got a little bit of traction, but I don't, I think it kind of faded or fizzled a little bit. And I don't know that again, like the more sort of ambitious you got with the traits that you wanted to map, the harder it got because of the many loci small effect and sort of the sample sizes that they were able to get with the volunteers. But yeah, that's right. It's, there's been some really fun attempts at getting at this with, with genetic techniques. Thank you, JL, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. Love the discussion. Thanks for your time and expertise. My Thank pleasure. you. Yeah, that's great. Happy holidays. Uh, let's see. There's B.W. Rock says, there's, is there something inherently different about canine versus feline lineages that make them more amenable to trait manipulation by humans? Yeah. Or, or, you know, again, sort of spinning it around. What is it about the cats that, like, are they controlling us um, mm. is one way of putting it, right? Like, how is it that they've convinced us, like, these wild yeah, yeah animals to bring them in their home and we feed them for free and you know like <laughs> clean their litter boxes for, again like we just like cater to their every their every myself included by the way guilty as charged like um it's, it's yeah it's really fascinating and, and then with dogs i think we think about it more like you know what are we getting out of this like doing the job of hunting or you know whatever it is or including it in our sort of daily lives um you know, I think there's some really, yeah, there's some really interesting, almost gets into sort of philosophical questions there. That's, that's, that's I also great. think it has to do with the 
genetic diversity of wolves, the ancestors of dogs, right, compared to the ancestors of cats, and someone must know that because that could play into it as well, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that reminds me, I mean, there are all of these, um, I should know more of the details. I'm not going to be able to recover it. But, you know, so these interesting, like, um, uh, sort of uh, experiment evolution with wolves to, to in these experiments that I think happened in like the 1950s or something in Russia, where they were like trying to select just for tamer wolves, like through generation to generation mm-hmm. specifically. And then if you do that as sort of an experimental evolution course, starting mm-hmm. from the wild canid, and then, you know, it'll still be a wild wolf at the end, but what are the ones that you've selected for that are the most sort of like friendly basically? Um, and so that was, you know, that's another attempt or a different kind of route at going at some of the same questions. Yeah. Um, here's another one. Oh, Philip is in Wales. Good to have you here, Philip. Yeah, Thank you. Thanks for joining. Um, Vanity is listening in uh, while flying back from Seattle to JFK. <laughs> so cool. Uh, ah. Glad that you can get a little Tuivo in, up at 39,000 feet. There you go. Uh, James Perfect. says, we had a Chihuahua with a herding instinct yeah there you go it to our humans <laughs> this is great james so this is some of those hit is i'm curious if that signal is hidden somewhere in this yeah, high dimensionality yeah. data analysis the fate yeah, mapping that cool. the authors did <laughs> milo said it would be amazing if there's a corresponding study on domesticated foxes i'm yeah. pretty sure there would be interesting conclusions or at least correlations with dogs yeah, and that's, I think there is also, this is ringing a little bit of a bell with some of these studies out of Russia, yeah. um, or the, so even the Soviet Union days, and um, worth um, doing some Google searches on yeah. that and, and, and following that thread as well. Tom says, this paper embodies the sort of work that people barely dream about before the technology to acquire and analyze big, big, big genomic and behavioral data. Great summary discussion. Yeah, no, it's, why it's I mean, the data's here, and then the real question is how do we squeeze understanding from it and so i'm a big fan of of scientists who are like kind of taking on that massive challenge in interesting new ways good uh good engagement folks like their dogs julie says wouldn't it be more (laughs) training than just some breeds all dogs have super noses some dogs train to find drugs etc but not all dogs will find drugs yep well you can, can always breed to enhance these traits right that's the point yeah, which has been done. And so, and that, you know, I think this, uh, Julia, it's a good point, like kind of like the scent hounds, right? And so, you know, what was the natural selection that was happening in those ancestors that then have been repurposed into these, mm-hmm. you know, really like, again, these like really fine tuned applications. So whether it's detecting cancers, um, drugs, mm-hmm. explosives, and could we, you know, and I just don't know the field well enough, but that you could imagine that that could be a more directed as opposed to taking the sea bark, the 14 sort of phenotypes. You could maybe you could take a more focused approach on those and it might have some of the same themes and but with different biology behind it. Yeah. And then the question becomes, is there like a cleaner thread to get at sort of the biological basis? I just don't know. Um, but it could run through some of the, you know, so still probably you'd think neurodevelopment, but with a instead of through the, you know, optic chiasm as they're proposing for herding obviously you'd imagine this will run right through um olfaction and some of the you know the wiring to the nose and and, and how that's so fine-tuned i think there is some work in that field but i don't know like i, I think this is pretty new to do it at this mm. certainly at this scale and with this large of a data set oh gary says when my kids were little my neighbor's dog used to herd all of the kids in the park onto the playground it was amazing <laughs> to watch that's so cool yeah, innate behaviors. They just can't help themselves. Maybe Vincent and I are innate behaviors podcasting. We can't like resist once a month getting behind the microphone. Well, and- um, I certainly <laughs> like it, and I convinced you to like it, and you really have taken on to it, Neil. So I think you're you're here for the long run, probably. That's right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, let's not try to U-map that. We're, we'll just keep doing it and having fun. I think it's all about curiosity to a certain extent. You know, scientists uh, like to, to talk about their work. It's just mm-hmm. who they choose to talk to is usually restricted to other scientists. But we have yeah. uh, we got a snip that made us go beyond that. That's, yeah, right. <laughs> I think there's some more genetics under the hood there. <laughs> but yeah, Barb Max got a great one here. <laughs> and totally choose to ignore their slaves speaking as one, Us. yes. Yeah, yeah, and, I, and that's the right framing. I think that it's not that they're not perceiving um, the world around them and their um, human partners, but they're ignoring them as yeah. a as a as a, a, a pretty deep theme. So vanity says some noses are better than others. Training is huge, though. My GSDs were way easier to train than my Dalmatian. 
Hmm. Hmm. What's a GSD? I don't know, a dog breed, of course, but I'm not sure. Let's can we decode this? And Vanity will probably G-S-D clarify here. GSD dog, dog breed. German yeah. Shepherd. Dog. German Shepherd dog. There you go. Okay, Tom here. Uh, call, my mom cooked board. Okay, Tom was into border collies. Okay. Yep. Uh, I think dogs sn- smell yeah, the dead tissue. Good. Cancer has no smell. Maybe a cadaver dog. Uh, so they, they get uh, metabolites in the urine. That's what they're That's smelling. Right. Yep. Right. Which are, yeah, unique to, somewhat unique to the tumors. I mean, there's a yeah. echo of this, right, with oncolytic viruses that somehow over replicate in tumors and less so in normal tissue, which is sort of like being trying to leverage as a, as a therapy yeah. to tumor. So those, yeah, taking advantage of those metabolic or those slight differences between normal cells and cancerous cells in this case, in order to train on a, a scent. Yeah. I have to, I like this one. I'm sorry. Trisha loves me. So thank you. Trisha. I appreciate <laughs> it. Uh, foxes in Russia. There we go. There was a book. It was an yeah. end or run around Lysenkoism. Oh, cool. Cool. Yep. Uh, and Trisha is in Bristol, UK. Thank you, Trisha. Thanks for joining. My mixed terrier likes to herd. Okay, there so you go. yeah, there you go. And uh, Nicola is in Italy. Welcome, Nicola Toraca. I love it. <laughs> uh, Vanity says there's a great paper on high nurturing rat mothers affecting epigenetic changes that lead to calmer, less aggressive pups. It's fascinating. I bet. Yeah. Yep. I bet. Uh, and Trisha writes, I wonder what would happen if they studied the evolution of humans who lived in captivity due to chronic illness and lack of access to effective treatments. Trust me, we'll, we'd be evolving. Well, of course. That's right. Getting at the, um, connecting to the, we are evolving, connecting it to the genetics. Easier said than done. What about the microbiome in our pets that could be also playing a role in driving our behaviors? Absolutely. I know. This is great. So this brings up one of the old chestnuts, right? So maybe not the, it involves pets, but maybe not directly. So the, you know, the toxoplasma infections Mm. of mice that convince them that the smell of cat's urine is the most beautiful thing they've ever encountered and and come across. And then they like sort of the mice will gleefully um, uh, show themselves to the cat, which will then eat them and which continues the replication cycle of toxoplasma moving between Mm -hmm. hosts, sort Mm -hmm. of this microbial, um, uh, modification of behavior. How that applies out to the microbiome, I think, is a great question, which is also an active topic of research. And, um, you know, stay tuned. Maybe actually, you know, we're kind of coming up the year end for 2022, Vincent, so we can do a little bit of our science crystal ball gazing. What are going to be the breakthroughs in 2023 and beyond? And, um, you know, maybe this is the year for like behavior, like some r- real um, genetic links between microbiome and behavior. Um, Maybe I'll go out on a limb and make that as my prediction. Uh, I think it's still still <laughs> early days. I'm not early sure. Days. Yeah, maybe I 10 years tough. from now. We'll see. Maybe it's 10 tough. years. Some Philip says some UK companies are using dogs to detect bed bugs. I'm not surprised. You could train them. Uh, the, the, of course, we've heard that you can use dogs to detect a person who is infected with SARS-CoV-2. Yeah. Right. You so just have to train yeah. them. That's right. So this raises an interesting question. So if you're doing this with, and I just, and again, I don't know enough here, but if, if it's the same breed that you're training either to, you know, focus on a tumor, a bed bug, or another, uh, an explosive or mm-hmm. drugs, whatever it is, if it's the same breed, are you in that training? Um, so trained versus untrained, is it going through all the same circuits or, you know, neural circuits or... So the developmental pathways will be the same if you're using like, you know, siblings or something like that, but then training them differently. And then the question becomes like, is it the same biology that you're tickling or are there differences based on the cue that the dog is trained on? Um, That would be interesting to maybe, you know, to try to frame that up and see what the progress is. But um, even these simple, quote unquote, simple experiments, like easier said than done, I would say. So BW had a 150-pound Rottweiler as gentle as could be that would herd my kids when they would play in the yard. I don't think a Rottweiler is a herder, right? Yeah, I don't know. So we need to we need to do a deeper dive into the Seabark data set, which has, um, you know, all of at least the purebreds and then the scores and yeah. herd. Uh, I think that was one of them. And so, um, yeah, we'd have to pull that up like. I don't actually, is that so energy trainability? I'm not sure that that comes up. The herding is as one of the 14 phenotypes. And so um, Mm. how they pull that together is, uh, yeah, another question. But 
um, really interesting to, to think about those shared sort of features between different breeds. As so well. Julie says a lion it will in a way herd his prey until he finds the weak one to catch. Yeah, I guess that's yeah, correct, that's right? Herding or in that case, like even team hunting, right? That's yeah. a whole other yeah. behavior. Yep. Oh, oh, Julie loves me too. Thank you, Julie. I appreciate it. Appreciate that. We love the love. love. <laughs> uh, Barb Mac said Parkinson's patients supposedly have a different smell from healthy people. Possibly dogs could detect that in early stages. I would not be surprised. Yeah. yeah. Interesting idea. Yep. The uh, the sort of futility of our noses compared to other mammals, dogs included, is pretty. Particularly pretty after COVID, right? <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Trevor, welcome. First time from Norwich, UK. Welcome to uh, Twivo. By yeah, the way. Oh, you guys are great. There's 79 of you here. Yeah. And we have 62 likes. Maybe those of you, you can hit the like button. It doesn't cost you anything. And that helps other people find us. You know, the more, this is an algorithm at YouTube. The more likes, the more people are going to be recommended to come over. So check it out. Uh, back to Milos on the Siberian fox experiment is mind blowing. Yeah. Oh, oh, on so many levels, also very, very inspiring. The book How to Tame a Fox and Build a Dog is amazing, too. Okay, yep. got to look into that. That sounds cool. Agreed. Uh, they have a lineage that includes herding cattle. Not surprised, right? Yep. Oh, and Vanity said GSD is German Shepherd Got dog. the confirmation on that. Yep. Thanks, Vanity. Very good. All right. Uh, that's it for now. But you guys are uh, on fire today with these yeah. questions because I think dogs are... Inspiring everybody. Many people have dogs, and you have things to say about them, whereas everyone doesn't have a virus. Actually, everyone <laughs> does have a virus, but you don't know much about them to say anything because many yeah. of them are not doing anything to you. So Yeah, it's a different thought, relationship, like, not as cuddly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, was one more here. R.E., the microbiome, millions of years of evolution mm. results in if you can't beat them, kill the host, then join them, convince Coke, the pet human host, to support the microbiome. So this is a very interesting issue because the more you look at it, we did a, a brief paper on immune this week where the mm. microbiome is influencing antibody responses, right, to gut pathogens. Well, I mean, it's just at yeah. every level because we have lived with bacteria. You know, bacteria were first and they exist with everything that evolved on the planet. So you're going to have some very interesting evolutionary outcomes, yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, maybe another way of framing it um, is sort of the gene centered view of evolution. And so, you know, obviously, the if the imperative is for the genes, whatever, from wherever genome or source that they're coming from to, yeah, to, yeah. to continue to exist, then how do these sort of, you know, tenuous collaborations come together, um, all, ranging all the way from collaborative to um, adversarial. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that can lead to all this complexity in, in the forms and, and conglomerations of life. It's really fascinating. Well, you're getting very poetic, uh, Nelson. <laughs> but I, I think the, the interrelationships of microbiomes, viromes with their hosts is a huge area that is going to be many, many years sorting out if ever. But if you want to work on something, if you're a beginning scientist, man, that's, very cool, although not easy, not yeah. easy to do. Agreed. So much great uh, stuff. BW, Jeez. thank you for your contribution. And Appreciate folks, it. you know, there is a – there. I never ask you guys to contribute because you're all really good. But, yeah. you know, in the holiday spirit, why don't you hit the super chat button? <laughs> Give us a buck or whatever you'd like. Uh, this is the holiday season. It's a fundraising season. And so we'd That's love right. to have your support. All tax deductible in the U.S. It's all tax all deductible. Yeah, in the U.S. Yeah. because we are a nonprofit. But I don't know about elsewhere. But, Tom, the mind is boggled. That's good. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, agreed. All right. Yeah. Um, you want to do some picks, Nels? Yeah, let's close out with our – science picks of the week. I'll start. So um, just ran across a really cool um, post. Uh, this is titled, uh, it's on ghosts of science past. And so this is the author here is um, Brandon Ogbuno. He's got a, one of the best Twitter profiles or handles out there. He's big data cane uh, <laughs> on the faculty of at Yale at Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. And so he's, you know, a few months ago, there was a dust up. So um, E.O. Wilson, sort of one of the giants in the field of, of um, sort of, um, you know, nature, um, um, natural sciences passed away. And, um, you know, in the, in the kind of remembrances and also sort of, you know, looking back on his life, mm. 
some issues came up with some, you know, associations and, and with race science and various things like that. And so how do we deal with this? The ghost of science passed. And um, I really like um, Brandon um, Ogbuno's um, take here. So he connects it very like personally. So he met E.O. Wilson when he was a grad student and, and he was sort of a retired faculty, still active. And, um, and then, you know, I think what usually happens, as he points out, is like we have these dust ups and sometimes it's litigated on Twitter. There's sort of the whole sort of cancel scenario and then the backlash. Mm-hmm. And, and, the, and what he's raising is, you know, are we really making progress in these conversations when we sort of continuously sort of almost re- hit play on tape? when we deal with this. And so, you know, this takes a little bit of a dive behind the scene to not sort of like avoid this, but to try to add some positivity. So like one of the pullout quotes here is that, you know, to reconstruct a person's legacy is to grapple with complexity. We should not be afraid of the multiplicities that are at the lives of people that we admire. And so, you know, that kind of, I think, almost strange human quality that if we admire someone, we want them to be perfect or somehow bigger than life. And to take maybe a more realistic view of that, that doesn't sort of lead immediately to like a cancel culture scenario, but but doesn't just sort of back away and and say that that's OK, too. But to try to reflect on this and to, um, you know, to do to, to learn from it and to, and to use these conversations more positively to to try to make science a better place, to try to make society a better place. So anyway, this is my pick of the week. It's a short cool. read about, yeah, about five, ten minutes. And I think worth, um, you know, reflecting on a little bit. I like this quote. Uh, he says uh, he cherishes his copy of Consilience, the Unity of Knowledge, an ambitious but flawed book that contains one of my favorite ever quotes by a scientist. Quote, the ideal scientist thinks like a poet and works like a bookkeeper. And I suppose that if gifted with a full quiver, he also writes like a journalist. <laughs> Isn't that great? Isn't that cool? <laughs> I really yeah. like that. Really yep. good. All right. Agreed. So how about you, Vincent? What's your science pick of the week? All right. So I'm stealing a pick from Chiara <laughs> Mingarelli, who was ah. on Twitter uh, a few weeks ago. She's an astrophysicist now. Cool. Very and, cool. And um, she's the sister of Angela Mingarelli, who's our latest addition to the Twiv hosts. Oh, fantastic. Uh, she is a young PhD student at McGill, and mm. uh, she's joining us once a month. But her sister's she mentioned, I said, get her on Twiv. So we had her and she talked about black holes and gravitational wave backgrounds. She came right here to the uh, incubator. Oh, very cool. Anyway, her pick was this book by Sean Carroll called Mm. The Biggest Ideas in the Universe, Space, Time, and Motion. And she said, it's really wonderfully written. I got it. I'm reading it and I love it. So uh, I want uh, everyone to check it out as well. So Sean, there are two Sean Carrolls. One of them is That's right. the evolutionary guy, right? Evo Devo yep. guy. <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, <laughs> and and yeah. this one is the space guy. So, <laughs> That's right. And I like them both. They're both amazing. How about that? You have the same name and you're... <laughs> That's really right. really good yeah, writer. Can, can exactly. you believe it? Yep. Convergent so that's, evolution. <laughs> that's my big, yeah, the convergent evolution. Yep. Uh, but well, folks, great. if you, uh, any of you want to send us a pic, we'll read it here. You could send it to Twivo at microbe.tv. Uh, and uh, we have now a bunch of people responding to my request for bucks. I'm, I really appreciate it, folks. Oh, I don't wow. mean to. The, thank you, Barb Mack from the UK. Happy holidays. Uh, Roberto mm-hmm. Amezqua. Thank you so much for your contribution. Um, and yes, YouTube does take a cut of this, but you know it's a good platform that we are using and uh, we don't pay anything for it. So I don't mind helping them out as, as well. Yeah. Uh, Milos, thank you so much for uh, your contribution as well. Rob, thank you. The rolling, t- the roiling 20s are rolling <laughs> over, <laughs> over, over, and over. That's right. Uh, and Nicola says, Vincent is getting into physics. Uh, mm. Not really. I'm just really, um, you know, Angela told me her sister was a great communicator. And that's what we were about on Micro yeah. TV, great scientists who can communicate. So I wanted to get her on. And I was blown away because she's a wonderful communicator. She sat here next to me. She's looking at the camera the whole time. She's talking with her hands. Not once did she hit the mic, which I tend to do now yeah. and then. She knows how to look and explain things. And you know what's really cool? She works like a couple of blocks from here at the at the Flatiron Institute. Nels, oh, there's yeah. A, do you yeah, know yeah. the Simons Foundation, Nels? Yeah, I do. And I have a... Um, 
funny story. I'll try to do it quickly. So um, one of my colleagues here, we bo- our kids are both in the same daycare class, and he was just at the Flatiron for a uh, sabbatical the last six months through the Simons. Yeah, he's a computer scientist. And so, um, yeah, really great institute and small world in science and the connections within two minutes we can come for up sure. with sort of. Yeah. For sure. So th- she said that the Flatiron Institute has mm-hmm. – they have a lot of uh, astrophysicists there because much of what they do is computational. And she said that's exactly. what she does. She goes there. They have a computing cluster in the basement, and she runs whatever it is that she does. She's actually a faculty there and yeah. at UConn, and she lives in New York because she doesn't have to go <laughs> to UConn about once a, a month, you know. So it's very a good cool. Gig. And speaking of big data, like our dog, you know, thousands of dog genomes is like a drop in the bucket compared to the data crunching they're doing at the flat iron in related places in the yeah yeah, yeah. Yep. that's why they need to have a cluster she said we have a cluster i said what's that a chocolate bar <laughs> 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 no it's a computing cluster you boron yeah. <laughs> all right folks thanks so much for your contributions thanks for being here today we got this is a great uh, number Nels. we have 80 people and 77 likes you can't get much better than that beautiful all right happy that is end uh, of the tw- year Great and end of the year episode. Now, thank you for picking uh, that paper out. Thank you. Thank uh, thanks to Cliff Christian, who is our listener pick on the thanks. paper. Good. Thank yeah. you, Cliff. Uh, that's Etwivo number eighty-five. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash Twivo. Uh, if you want to send a pick or even a question, by email Twivo at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, and you didn't contribute today, but you'd like to elsewhere, we have other ways you can contribute. Go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. Uh, Nels Eldi is at cellvolution.org. He's got a website. You can check that out. And on Twitter, he's L Early Bird. Thanks, Nels. Good to do another year of podcasting with you. Super fun. Thank you, Vincent. Happy New Year to you and everyone early. We'll be back in 2023 for episode 86. We will be back next year. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'm looking for the damned artwork oh it's not here Uh (laughs) i'm gonna have to add it before i end up because i gotta get this uh, i'm sorry for the little um diversion here but you know i end up the the live streams with a a picture of a plaque and um we'll also be putting the music in for the i want to get i want to get the plaque thingy here where the hell is it i'm gonna have a little interruption there we go all right i'm gonna put it uh, Show in all scenes. There we go. Now I'm going to go back to Nell's. Okay, there we go. And I got our, our plaque there. There we go. Uh, anyway, music, I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can hear, find me at virology.ws. Music you hear on Twivo is performed by Trampled by Turtles. You can find their work at tramplededbyturtles.com. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks to our moderators. We had Les. Yes. We had Vanity from 39,000 Feet. We had Tom... Even Steph was here. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I think that's everyone. Thanks, all of you, for coming. If you want more live stream, come tomorrow night. That's Wednesday, 8 p.m. Eastern, Q&A with A and V. And I just had an idea to invite someone uh, to that episode. I'm going to try and do that at last minute there. We'll see if we can do that. Cool. Uh, you've been listening to This Week in Evolution. Oh, I should play the mu- music. I don't even know where it is. Ending music. <laughs> They're listening to This Week in Evolution, the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next year. Happy New Year. Till then, New year. be curious. <laughs> <laughs>